Hey there, welcome to Talk To Me Tuesday on a Tuesday. I'm your host, Mari B. And today we have a very special show that focuses on the month that we are celebrating today, Black History Month. In our community, this is celebrated every day. However, we want to recognize a few historic figures. Many African Americans have made history and fought for African Americans' recognition, rights, and freedom. These influential figures took a stand with such pride that motivates us to follow along the path they carved out. So please allow me to introduce to you our panel members today that we're gonna go into a very transparent conversation on what this month really means. So we do have attorney Clarence King, who's an attorney at D. Miller & Associates. We have vice principal from IDEA Mays College Prep, owner of Key to Fitness, Keandria White. And we also have co-founder of Alive, founder of Key Connector Show, um, founder of Code Black, and certified life coach sociologist Ken Henry with us. So welcome, guys. I am so happy um, to welcome you guys and have you guys on today's show. We have all types of walks of life and a lot of um, backgrounds that you guys really bring to the forefront Um, So I would like to have each panel member uncover what your career path is, what it means to you, and how has African-American history influenced you in your career? Awesome. Well, I mean, I can go first. I think uh, for me, (laughs) um, I I realized, you know, I I grew up, first of all, I was born and reared in Louisiana, Lake Charles, Louisiana, to be specific. And um, in my high school there, you know, I had to take, it was a requirement to take African-American history and literature uh, before graduating. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that time, you know, I thought that was just the norm. That's what everybody, every high school student has to go through as well. And uh, after graduating college uh, in Louisiana at McNeese State University, I five months later moved to California to go back to school. And I was in Long Beach and I then getting in an entirely different culture, you know, uprooted from my roots, um, not having a lot of support system. Uh, I, I really, you know, I went in as a very confident man of color, uh, but, and with a mission, however, I realized that there is such a difference uh, from my roots in the, in the South as a, as a minority, especially as a black man, versus the roots in the West Coast, right? Where they didn't have as much, uh, you, you, if you remember this, the Atlantic slave trade, the slavery was in the South. So still today, the majority of your, your black uh, Americans are in the South. When you get in a place like California, yes, it's very diverse, but we don't have as strong of a presence there. You know, you don't see a lot of black inf- uh, influential folks uh, in your face like you do here, you know, and how colleges are so important and fraternities and sororities and debutante balls and, you know, all those things, that's a different world to them. And so for me, that's when I finally felt like, wow, you know, now I feel like I have a culture on my shoulder because there was so much ignorance that I experienced and not malicious, just ignorance when it came to the black culture um, specifically. And um, so I found myself, and because I'm not a passive person by any, you know, means of word, so I found myself, you know, constantly having to educate folks on who we really are. And um, sometimes that even meant some of our own people. Um, I interjected myself, I, one quick story, uh, I interjected myself in a conversation with a, you know, African-American female, and she was talking to two other folks. Turns out one was a pastor, and they were all the different races, and I heard her say, don't make me act Black. And I was talking to someone and I just heard that and I'm just like, okay, you know, this is bothering me. Like, you know, and then finally I couldn't help it. My, you know, traditional kid, I walk over, I, excuse me, how are you guys doing? Couldn't help it over here. What does that mean? And, you know, it hit me whenever the, the guy says, you know, ghetto. And so I just looked at him. I said, no, I don't know. I said, because, you know, ghetto comes in different shades yours, hers, hers. That's a state of mind. That's not, that has nothing to do with a race. I said, and so I pulled her to the side and said, you know, sis, I'm not angry or whatever, but I just want you to be careful. We have a responsibility. And if you're going to tell people this is who we are, then they have no choice to believe you. You're right. Especially if you're there on the interaction. So I realized there in career and in, in everything, all my endeavors, you know, is very, very important. And I am one person who uh, who embraces taking that responsibility and carrying my culture on their shoulders. So when I go places and I do things and how I behave, I am bringing my people there. And so I do believe that we have that responsibility. And unfortunately in this country, um, 
you know, history has, has shown us that time and time again, that we actually need to have that mindset. It's very right. imperative that we have that mindset. So. Right. And no, I appreciate that you really kind of walked us through your career path where you came. And I know you're going to highlight on how that has resonated and how you've made a difference. But right. before we do that, I, I love that you said you guys, we all have a responsibility, right? So right. I want to um, highlight on our other two panel members to tell us a little bit about your a career path, your upbringing as well, and maybe if it's different cultures within state by state. So, Keandra, what do you, um, as far as your career path? I was hoping you're going to choose me next because he was in California and I'm from Arizona. And Arizona is like you have every race, but you kind of stay in your own lane. Like uh, you hang out accordingly and, and such things, which is very different out here. Um, I moved out here in 2015 to San Antonio. But I always knew I was going to be a math teacher. You could ask me in second grade. I was that strange kid. I was going to be a math teacher. No one asked me questions. There was no opinion. Just like my man's, I'm very opinionated. And I didn't have to argue in that class. It was very black and white. So I love numbers, just facts. Facts are fiction with it. I always knew I was going to be a math teacher. But then I didn't have any teachers that looked like me. So then it was like a push. Like, mm, not only am I going to be a teacher, but I'm going to be a female teacher a lesbian female teacher and I'm gonna be black and I was like oh I'm about to be fired and then I graduated high school which I, I did act a fool most of the time but I graduated high school went back to high school graduation the year after and I saw my middle school math and English teacher together and I walked up to them and I was like hey guys what's up and how are you doing and they're like oh where are you working and I'm like no I play college basketball now and I'm getting my math degree. And they started hysterically laughing. And they were like, we talked every day that you would either be in jail or pregnant. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. And then that moment I was like, I can't be a teacher. That's not good enough. I'm going to teach the teachers. I'm going to, I can, I can make a bigger difference by making a difference there. Because clearly my teachers made a difference to me, but who is influencing them? So that was my career path in like, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to continue to progress where now I just got accepted into a principal program where I can, can progress with that. And then with personal training for me personally, it's like ownership, uh, generational wealth, uh, being able to put a stamp on something just like in education to have a name like Keandra White be on a building. I think that alone is, is a stamp. So for me, when it comes to career, it's just finding a place that belongs and people that look like me. Yeah, I love it. And I and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about how you're already making those differences in your community. I want to turn it over to Attorney Clarence King on your career path and how it's influenced you and um, even in your upbringing as far as college and schooling. Um, it's definitely been a very, very um, important thing from the beginning. Uh, both my parents are historically Black College University graduates. So my upbringing was at homecomings or at different events. And I was kind of always um, never pressured or never um, directed towards that. Um, but they they instilled how it was definitely more than adequate and never to uh, take others' opinions on those type of things and then feel that because it's not the mainstream and or um, what I guess society tells you is the uh, higher caliber uh, of an education or experience. Um, it's still kind of like his story is kind of his story type of thing. Yeah. And we've all been getting, we've all gotten uh, different variations of such. Um, so uh, it was very, very important in my household to um, look into things for your own self, run your own race, do your own path, as well as being around people that look like you um, is, is strength. Um, it's, it's more of a, a, a family feel. Um, and people often have the uh, misconception that uh, going to a predominantly uh, African-American school gives you like a, a false sense of security um, because America isn't indicative of those, I guess, dynamics or parameters. But at the same time, I feel like it gives you a sense of strength to go out into the world that looks different. And you have that, like he said, like um, Mr. Henry said, that uh, that almost that badge of, of uh, honor or, or courage, they've already built you up and poured into you. So when you get out there, you're kind of already ready for those things, kind of like an armor almost kind of thing going on. So um, I uh, went to uh, Alabama a and University for undergraduate. I went to Texas Southern for my master's and I went back to Texas Southern again for uh, Thurgood Marshall School of Law for my JD. So I'm three times through HBCUs and I love them. I stand behind them. I'm for them at all costs um, at the same time. So I wear that brand proudly and, uh, and in the career path, it just makes you want to go do more. You want to come back because one, even to take one microcosm of a, a role model that I went to the actual university, Thurgood Marshall. Like how could you not be... Um, yeah. In, inspired and 
find and actually make a trail for yourself and come behind someone that's done so much for your for your profession, your culture, um, the actual view of your uh, ethnic background and not want to do more. So I feel like I have a lot in front of me. I'm looking forward to that challenge. And I carry myself proudly as African-American male and anywhere I go into. Um, and we have to make sure we always understand our youth and everyone else that don't be apologetically black ever. You want to yeah. be make sure that I, I hold this at a high regard. You should as well. And let me show you by my actions, not not lip service, but my actions, how I carry myself, how I perform. Those are all things we have to instill in each other and hold each other accountable for. Wow. I feel very lucky to be with such a strong panel. Um, your career path and what you guys stand for and what you guys are not just doing now, but want to keep doing in the future. Because as you guys are all mentioning, it's not over here. You're still you still have a long way to go. So I want to highlight your careers and your upbringing and even from your childhood. But before that, how have you embraced your culture in your workforce? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm honored, too, with these two uh, <laughs> to be on that level. Love you guys. Uh, it just it inspires me. Um, you know, again, you know, when I was in Orange County, I'll tell you guys, well, I graduated in broadcast journalism and sociology. And then I went to L.A. to do, honestly, fashion business school because mm -hmm. uh, like Keandra, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, it's so interesting that I'm on here with these two because at seventh grade, I could I told everyone I'm going to be an attorney. Um, that's what I wanted to do. And then I was going to be a fashion designer. I don't know how that was going to work, but <laughs> I guess I was going to be a really great, best, a really amazing dress attorney. There we and go. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, as time went on and I ended up going, I changed it, uh, my major from fashion designing just before I even started the school to business. And I said, well, I feel like I need the business part. I feel like I could make it on. And I'm glad I did that because after finishing and getting in the industry, in LA and I've been blessed to be in some amazing spaces out there. Um, but I did learn, I did the right thing because there's so many talented folks that didn't know there's not a lot look like us, you know, but uh, there's so many of them that are, you have the skill set, but they don't have the business, uh, didn't know the business savvy of it. Right. So um, I did that for a while. I was doing great. And I realized quickly, quickly, you know, I in, in, interned in entertainment. I remember my whole entire division. I don't think I've seen, but maybe one other person of color, <laughs> And at the time, and um, I realized how big that was. So I really gave it my all with everything that I did. I showed up and I, I did my best to show out. And I, you know, I was recognized for that. But I had to be honest, I felt a sense of loss and I couldn't understand why. And so eventually, to make a long story short, I realized that my big calling and what I'm very, you know, really passionate about, and I feel like that more important is my calling, is that I wasn't giving, feeding back into people. You know, here I was making some really good money at a young age, you know, in this fashion world, but it was very superficial. And I'm dealing with personalities and mindsets that's really, I, that I don't really resonate with, right? And I really don't even like, to be honest. And so I got into the foster care system and uh, I ended up taking up a major pay cut, but I could tell you, I fell in love and I started, um, but I was in Orange County. And if you know anything about Orange County, California, you know, that it's not where you have the, the, the blacks or the very small minority there. And so I didn't have any, that much interactions with a lot of black foster kids. That was LA County. And so most of my kids were, um, you know, white, Latina, and I had a couple of Asian kids there. And so for so long, I would feel, I, I enjoyed my work and I loved them to death, but I felt guilty. I felt that, you know, I need to be in LA. There's a lot of black boys that need me, that need my example and, and, and to expose them to what I was exposed to, right? And I applied and I applied at different companies. God never saw fit for me. And I'm like, what? It was affecting my ego. You know, I never could get in LA, but I realized after a few years and I stayed there for nine years in that um, and growing in my, my career working for the county, but I realized, no, I was needed there. And when I, and when I realized that I started playing back certain scenarios and things that I was experiencing that where I made a major difference being at, at certain tables sharing certain perspective that were they were missing at the time and uh and so I realized no I I've, I've I've actually helped too to open some eyes up in a lot of ways of who we are and what we can do and that kind of thing and so uh for, from that point on that's when I knew you know it's time now to do my own thing and to start making you know where I can have more control and that's how I I basically grew to start doing my own nonprofits and uh, helping people build nonprofits and things of that nature yeah wow. 
I love that. I love how you've really embraced it in your workforce and you made it a, your own workforce, right? I, I love that. And um, anyone else have anything that they've embraced their culture and their workforce that has highlighted um, where you're at today? Well, I think for me personally, being in education, it's, it's huge. You're dealing with young individuals that some of these kids have never experienced anyone Black before, let it be a man or a woman. And now they're in your classroom and you're the example of what a Black woman is. Mm -hmm. So if I go in and I'm hot and I'm angry, they're going to go out in the streets and think that that is how a Black woman reacts. Mm -hmm. So when I started teaching, I took that to heart Mm -hmm. because I taught math for five years and then got into this position. And for me, it was like every single day, I wanted to show them love. I wanted to show them kindness. Mm -hmm. So that's what they expected from regardless if I'm very light skin, I'm mixed. This is what you can expect. Mm -hmm. We are, we're kind, we're beautiful. This is how you treat everybody and just give them that experience. I think within education, sometimes you get a lot of different colored kids or you might have one class and everybody in there is white and they're looking at you crazy or you got Hispanic kids and they're like, I don't even know what you're saying, miss. I speak Spanish. And like, it's very important in education to give them that opportunity to really dissect you as a person. And and I ran with that. And I took that to heart and making sure every day that I showed up and showed out and let them know who I was and what I stood for and what I bring to the world. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I do want to highlight um, for you guys to, to hear and see the type of support that you guys have that is watching right now. I do have a couple of comments. I have Matthew saying, woohoo, go Keandria White. So I know you have some great supporters and you are doing something great out there um, to have supporters. And I have Melinda saying, Mari, what a panel. So I want to just motivate you guys on how you guys are already impacting and influencing those that are watching. Um, I think a lot of the influential aspect starts at home. I think uh, what Keandria just brought up is, you know, what do these kids see at their home when they come to the schooling? They see something different. Um, So I want to ask you guys, um, as a panel, growing up, did your parents or your family, can we kind of heard from you on how Black history was celebrated with you? Um, Or what did your family do to ensure you understood the importance of your culture? It's not just about skin. It's your culture of African-American history. I think I have a very unique story. Um, Being half and half, um, my mom raised me and she's a 4'11", blonde hair, blue-eyed woman. And then she has these six-foot son, uh, black son, and, and me who's average height. Um, but my mom, at a very young age, made sure I knew I was a strong black woman. Mm-hmm. And for coming from someone who is blonde hair, blue-eyed, I don't know how she did it, but she embraced the culture. She didn't pretend she knew the culture. She reached out to every black person she knew, like, what do I do with her hair? What do I tell you about this? What are important things? Like, I was very blessed to practice Black culture every single day. Not Black history. Mom, not a a single individual. My mom made sure, hey, no one treats you different. No one talks to you different. You're Black. You need to know you're Black. And here's what comes with it. So I have a unique story in that. It's like someone who didn't know the culture taught me the culture. Yeah. That's That's beautiful. That's definitely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's super powerful that it doesn't have to be your own to reflect on another culture. I think that's very powerful for those of us that are listening, um, especially when we're in a year of last year that we experienced what we did as a nation. I think it's important that you don't have to be from African-American descent to understand the history. And now I wanna ask you guys, I asked you in your home, now I'm gonna ask you the same question and in your schooling system. If you remember celebrating Black History Month or if your school or even Keandra in your school now, if this is a big deal or was it a big deal in your school? Fortunately, in my, um, I guess, uh, elementary, uh, middle school and high school, um, I attended an art school. So um, they made a big deal to make sure they emphasized the types of, one, not just um, in the uh, education or uh, maybe engineering or anything else, but we have a lot of people that have poured into the arts as well. Um, so not only was it a year round thing, there were certain themes and certain things you learned through your artistic uh, magnet. Um, but definitely it was a, b- a big focus on my, um, of course, my undergraduate and my, my postgraduate classes um, because we were um, on the campus of 
historic ground. Um, we were at places that we had to go to initially, and it, it was not a choice initially. Going to HBCUs wasn't a choice. It was because there was no other school you could attend at that point in time. So in order to find a higher education, you were kind of siphoned here or nothing at all. And you went there and you and you found a pride in that. So definitely it was a big focal point in my upbringing educationally. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and look, I, I want to focus on not just our schooling, but also what you see in the media. Um, this is something extremely important to us as a culture and as a society. And, and with Black History Month this year, they choose some words, some strong, powerful words. And those words and the phrase they use is representation of African-Americans. I added a little bit more, right? In our culture, what does that mean to you? How deep does that resonate to you? Um, and we all have a, a different opinion, but what does representation of African-Americans in our culture mean to you? Yeah, I think it's, go ahead, guys. I think it's, I think it's vital. One, because that kind of, unfortunately, at times dictates how we're treated to those that aren't exposed to us on a regular basis. So if your representation is only through one skewed lens, and often, unfortunately, in media, it is through a certain propaganda uh, glazed lens, um, some people are afraid when there's no need to be afraid. Some people are more apprehensive, and there are, they're kind of more on guard when we have more things in common than we have unlike. So I mean, I think representation is very, very key. And the more, um, like we've all said, we're put in rooms with people that aren't exposed to us normally, and they realize that, oh, I was taught incorrectly or I, I heard incorrectly, that's going to slowly swing the pendulum to where, okay, I have a firsthand experience as opposed to um, people actually being malicious and actually wanting to offend you or wanting to, um, uh, I guess, start something that was negative. They just don't know any better. So representation is vital. Right. And huge for us, um, our principal is black and both assistant principals, it's me and another lady, we're black. Mm -hmm. And we, it was the first week of school and no one had seen the principal yet, right? And he's this very small man, he's an awesome dude. And uh, the kid came downstairs and he's like, man, they just messing with me because I'm black. And the kid just going off. And I was like, the principal's black. I'm taking you to the principal and he's black. And he was like, oh, he's black? And like, but that moment is like, who did you think you were gonna go see? Like. And like his whole outlook on education in that moment was like, oh, we're here. Like, okay, they're not doing like, oh, I'm not, okay, okay. I could go talk to him, send me to him. You know, it, it was just a, a change that i never seen before. I never also had a black principal, but yeah. representation matters because you feel like you're not singled out, you belong. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, yeah. And, I, and I think for me, like I, again, like I said, um, I, I went to all black schools, uh, all black magnet schools. so. It was just, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I feel very blessed because I have uh, the time I grew up in. Because, you know, if we would have went back it, even a decade, it would have been different. You know, my family yeah. was very vocal about the stories and things they've gone through. And I'm grateful they were vocal and shared those things with us so that we could appreciate the space we were in. But um, we always celebrated that in our city always it, it's always been a tradition since I can remember having a huge African-American festival uh, which is getting ready to happen um, later this month actually and I'm actually interestingly enough speaking um, on a panel there we already recorded it because uh, it's virtual this year so it's kind of cool because I actually I don't think I've ever participated other than just going and enjoying it I don't think I've ever done anything and I moved away 20 years so I think I've always had that in the school and in my culture and I grew up in the black church you know most of my uh, family on my mom's side, you know, I have tons of ministers in the family for generations. Um, so the Black experience is definitely, I, I have lived. Um, but as you, you know, I kind of waited uh, on this question about the media because let them go because I'm, I'm very, very passionate about this because, you know, as you, you heard earlier with this responsibility that we have, and I feel that one of the major issues is that, and that's it, this is not a new thing. This is something that has been going before we were kind of forced to, to have this buffoonery, you know, to kind of make it and get a little slice of something to come and um, entertain, uh, you know, the, our counterparts and things of that nature and uh, play the maids and play the, the villains and all these things here, um, which kind of not, did nothing but further reinforce 
that, that negative stereotype of who the black man, the black woman is, the black woman is hypersexual, you know, uh, because of, you know, this mentality brought down from slavery because it was forced upon them, right? Um, and then the black man is this, this villain that needs to be controlled. And if you don't tame him, you know, it, it, it could, it could be, it costs you your life and yada, yada. And now as we've moved, you see it in comedy because we have adopted and I wrote, I wrote a piece on um, cultural competency that I'm using for two different entities. Um, but I talk a lot about that in this because what we've done is this, this historical trauma that has been imposed on us from slavery, we've carried that over and we still are healing from that. But it's difficult because we don't really see it because it's so indoctrinated inside of us now to where, you know, even myself, I was saying this growing up, you know, oh, my, oh you have a black mama, she do this, do that. And we had this pride about getting beat if you do something. But where did that come? That is not who, that's not African culture. Right. That was learned from from slavery. So, so slavery is not African culture. It interrupted African culture. And so we went ahead and we thought, well, that's how you get them in line too. you beat them in line and you get it together. So those kind of things was brought in there. Right. Even to where we what I deal with with the anti sex trafficking movement. What do we do? We we're the first ones. We've been hit with it the hardest. Right. Since the original you know, uh, uh, sex trafficking of, of slavery to now. And then we've seen the crack era with the crack academic. So everybody, black family, either been touched by it or they know someone that's been touched by it. And what do we do? That same mentality of, well, they want to do that. They think it's a choice. Then you let them go. We take the kids. If they have any children, we protect them and you just let them be out there. They, they know better than that. They want to live that life. They're choosing to be drug addicts and prostitutes or whatever, because there's a miseducation. And then we have this, our culture with hip hop, right? I'm, I love music. I'm a major music lover, but we have to call it what it is, okay? The Cardi B's of our time is not helping us. The Megan Thee Stallion, I don't care if she's from H-Town, you're hurting us. I don't want my daughter to look to you to ever have to, to, to aspire to be that. You know, you're talented and you're great and you can do a lot more without giving this. And I don't care if you came from the hood or wherever you came from, you don't have to be, stay there. You know, we have got to get healthy and we have to call these things out and not worry about playing the fence and not worry about uh, uh, like we're judging. No, it's a fact. We're being hurt. When you look at sex trafficking all over this nation still today, the majority of women being trafficked in a staggering number are black women. OK, the majority of on the ground trafficking are black men that are doing it. So the fabric of our community is being torn apart because we're playing the fence or we're kind of, well, that's over there. We, if, if it's gonna change, it's gonna take us to be involved and media has a major, major responsibility uh, to play. And so, you know, I think we have some great folks out there doing some amazing things. We have great music artists out there that are really representing us well. We have great actors, we have great comedians. We have a lot of people out there doing great, but we have got to call out those and not in a way of putting them down, but in a way of loving up on them to help them to see, use your power to help our people progress and move ahead. Right. Not to, you know, help someone else's uh, agenda or further their, 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 their narrative. You're bringing up a great point because not only did we just mention, it kind of starts in the household. So some of these media individuals, they probably don't know any better because again, in their household, but this is why it's very important. And it's our responsibility, just like this panel to make a difference, to make a difference on making the, making sure the narrative is the right narrative, right? And not a controlled narrative, or um, like you mentioned, it being, um, you know, tailored in the media or on music. So it is our job. We do have a very, very important role, just like our historic figures and our ancestors did once upon a time. Our role is a little bit different on how we're going to show that history for our youth of tomorrow. So speaking of that, our historic figures are very important because they've carved out a path for our freedom. OK, we're continuously carving that path, as we just mentioned. So I want to ask you guys kind of a deep question. How does it make you feel that in a way history is repeating itself with all these things we just experienced last year with the social injustice? And we're coming up to close to anniversaries of members that have died and went through a lot. So how does that feel for you guys that we're kind of living a little bit of what happened in the past? That's good. I think it's, uh, it's very unfortunate that it has, um, I guess, replayed itself in so many aspects. Um, at the same time, um, I think that we have to have a, um, 
an understanding, but not necessarily a place of contentment at all. Um, now, granted, also take um, take heed to the actual strides being made, but also focus on the ones that have to be made in the future. So I think that as, as we're playing it, so because it was never fixed initially or addressed properly, it was kind of put a Band-Aid over it or kind of initially think about this. This, when we finally, now I think COVID played a lot of a role and when George Floyd was murdered, when that happened, we were all were at home. We were glued to a phone, a television or something of that nature. That was kind of the first time in my life, I can't speak for anybody in my life, that I saw other ethnicities kind of join in with the outrage. We've been outraged for so long, it's kind of like, they're just mad. It wasn't about the actual entire country being repulsed by it until they actually looked at it and kind of took away that, forget the color of this person. This is a person on the ground being suffocated. Like when that aspect began to penetrate and get people to actually discuss it outside of their own personal biases, that's when it started to, I think from in my experience, see people that actually be like, hold on now, we have to join in with them and align ourselves. And if we don't speak on it, we're kind of perpetuating the same thing to continue to happen. So it's disheartening, um, say the least, that it continues to overplay itself over and over. But at the same time, I think that this one was kind of a tipping point in my opinion, that pushes the envelope a lot further, at least for our, in my time on um, on this God's green earth, uh, have seen other uh, ethnicities also be outraged. That's a big component. We can't be alone in the outrage because that, unfortunately, a lot of people to point the finger or change into like they're just angry. And that's not, not the actual, we are angry, we're very angry, but it's warranted. It's not just blind anger, but yeah. that's my take on that. And to yeah. piggyback on that, when and this this could just be my opinion, but when you got Angela Davis and the other activists doing this, right? You saw black people in the crowd. You saw all the Afros. This was the black movement, right? And then it's like I feel like small steps happen from there, and then another one, and then small steps. But when you look at this one and you see white people in the front and white people stepping in front of black people that are on on their knees and they're like absolutely not. I feel like when the world sees that. Now it's like these little strides better start make, becoming sprints because now we're not by ourselves. It's not black people alone. You got Hispanics out there. You got white women stepping in front of black men like, what are you guys doing? And I think with that, this is the time to start sprinting. It's not like, oh, they're with us. Like, oh, no, no, no. Let's all go. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, yeah. what do you have for us? Yeah, I, th I think uh, everything they're saying is definitely right on because, you know, this was, it's a fact. There's there's never been a, a, a point in history where you've had this amount of people. And then it, it wasn't just here in the America. This was around the world. Right. You looked at places like Ireland, you know, it was just, it was um, really inspiring. Um, you know, but if you think about it, we've, we've always had, and, and, and this just the nature of life and the way things go, we're going to always have that progression. And I'll tell you why. Because even if you think about the Underground Railroad, there were whites involved in the Underground Railroad that were allowing their properties and things to be used and putting in there. And that was at this time, that was not popular. That was not, you could be lynched yourself, murdered yourself if you're found helping. Um, so they risked a lot, right? But they couldn't be out outwardly, you know, like we are now, right? With the laws and everything protecting you. Um, and then you saw a civil rights movement, right? When you look at that on the on Bloody Sunday on the Selma Bridge, you had white priests and you had uh, nurses and other city folks in there, Jews. You had a lot of different folks in there too that were standing up who risked their lives. They were beat as well. Those police officers beat everyone that was in that march. And so you you kept as you kept time goes on, you kept seeing more and more. And so what happens as time goes on, a lot of that old mindset dies off, and the, the offspring of some of these bigots and, and, and races, they're not growing up in that world. So they have an opportunity now to be exposed, to go to school, right? There's no segregation and all this. So now I'm being touched by these human beings that you're saying is so this, but I think they're amazing folks. Actually, I'm being treated better by some of them than my own folks. I'm learning from them. So no, you're wrong, dad. You're wrong, mom. And so that's what you're seeing now. So you started seeing this time where, and if you look at TikTok, there's a lot of videos in that where, where kids, you know, teenagers and their parents are at odds about this thing. They're mad because the teens are out there, you know, protesting or whatever. And I was down in LA myself protesting. And I remember a good friend of mine who's um, in a legal field and he is, you know, a, a white guy. And he says, 
you know, he asked me about, hey, you know, don't you think the generation today, because my brother's in law school right now, my younger brother, and I, you know, uh, I just find certain things that are great, they're awesome, but they could be very entitled. And I said, yeah, I said, that's true. I said, look at the world they came into. I said, they came into right now. Look at the parents, okay? As time go on, value systems break down, right? Um, but I said, look who's out here right now. I said, what's the majority? I said, it's them. I said, that entitled mindset they have is what's going to help change the world and what's going to bring prog prog progress. I yeah. said, and so that's their strength. I said, so where they need us, they need us to do the things that they don't know how to do. They're on the front lines. I said, but you don't see most of our age grouping up out here. I said, so the things that we know in legislature and all this stuff, we need to use that energy now and show them where to channel that. Right. What's the next step? How to go? You know, where to go from that? So I, I'm excited, you know, about this. I love it. Um, I'm blessed to be around. You know, my my network is made up of so many different, you know, races. You know, even my, my own wife, you know, she's Filipino. Um, she thinks she's black if she listens to this, but um, <laughs> she's Filipino. <laughs> no, she's amazing. And um, but you know, we just I love, I'm a very diverse person. I love human beings, right? Yes, I'm very pro-black. I love black because that is. That's my responsibility, right? However, I love human beings and I want nothing more than to see us all really respect each other and really uh, look at each other for what it really is, right? And bring out the best in each other, so. Yeah, and I wanna to touch up a little bit about what each and every one of you guys said. I know Keandria said, you know, right now is the time we need to run. I agree, let's not make it temporary. Let's make right. it to where we're uncovering layers and we're getting deep to the core to where we can really make a difference. And then I agree, Ken, you just said, it's our youth that is in the forefront. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that their voice is loud and clear. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we are, um, like Clarence said, making a difference to our youth, our um, peers, and how are we influencing that? That's right. one of my next questions, is these challenges that we've actually seen and faced um, Clarence, you brought a good point. We were forced to be at home due to COVID, right? Um, however, that made us sit and watch the story. While in the past, the stories like you're too busy that you don't even see the news, you didn't really hear it and you hear little bits and pieces. Now, everyone really got to get details if you wanted to watch the video or didn't, which I myself have not watched the video, but you're seeing a man, an adult, die in front of a social media. So I think these challenges are very important. And I want to ask you guys, what are we doing? What are you doing? What is your career path or your workforce doing to be able to influence our peers? Like Ken Henry said, we got to help them. They're the ones with the voice. And hey, I'll take that. But what are we doing with our youth? youth? Because that is our Black history in 10 years from now. So what are y'all's thoughts? Yes, yeah, good. I feel um so I am a member of uh Kappa of Cybertarian Incorporated. Oh um, my god, my brother, I love him. I didn't know oh, that. Yes. Oh, hey, your pleasure, pleasure's mine. Spring pleasure's mine. 97. Um, yes. Yeah. Spring 07. <laughs> <laughs> so um it's a pleasure to um work with Guide Right. So it's a program we have. We work with upcoming young men mm -hmm. and we try to get them ready for professional um being men in their home and different things of that nature, even down to tying a tie. You will be surprised with tying a tie. Um is not a common thing that's known in a lot of homes that may not have a uh, influential father figure or even an older brother or an older uncle. Anybody in that household that can do these things for these young men, resume writing, all these type of things that you're going to pour into these young men. So one, when they hit that um, time of maturity, that 17, 18, even prior to that, they're going to the workforce. They're going into becoming fathers. They're going to be influential themselves. So with that being said, I, I love to tutor, mentor, all these things. My mom is a retired principal, so I've been around education my entire life, and I was kind of doing that by force at a younger age, but now I love it. I wouldn't trade it. Um, the impact you can have on young men and young women, for that matter, across the board, when they're impressionable, that's what's going to change. And maybe that you get that one person. Now, all things aren't going to go perfectly or swimmingly, but you get that one kid to open his eyes up a little bit more and not tap out to or not tap out, but like give up or lose hope or lose that little fire in them that is there because they're still kind of blank at that point in time. And you can imp influence them. You can pour into them positive as opposed to negative. So I take every opportunity I can do with that to reach out, talk, even something as small as going to a basketball game. Like just having them understand that you don't have to do whatever you've seen prior and you can still have a good time. You can still um, you can still dress well. You can wear Jordans. Jordans are not nothing is wrong with you being a polite <laughs> young man and doing all these things while taking care of your 
your business, taking care of your grades, taking care of your family, being chivalrous, doing all these things that are intangible that should be in young men that we have to pour and force in them on a regular basis. That's what we can do. We can all do it. Forget a program. You can see a young man at church. You can see a young man at Kroger. It does not matter. You can have any kind of influence you choose to have as long as you do so. So the more you reach out, the more you talk, the more you encourage, pick them up. Don't let them assume that oh, I messed up, so I'm, I'm washed now. No, you have a lot of life ahead of you, young man or young woman. Please try again. I can tell you I'm far from uh, blemishless, but I'm still here and I'm still going forward. So just instill that kind of like resiliency in them. It changed their entire projection. Yeah. And I want the other panel members to answer here shortly. But some of the things that you brought up nowadays in 2021, what does professionalism really look like? Does it have to be in a suit or can it be in a T-shirt? And or are you working at home? It's looking with so many shades, so many looks. So there there is we're taking away the stereotype. And I think that is awesome. And, you know, Keandre, I want to kind of uh, turn it over to you on the youth, too. And then we'll finish it off with Ken um, Henry on, you know, influencing one kid can also influence a group of kids. Mm -hmm. So I want you to kind of highlight a little bit of what you see within the schooling system that and how you kind of see that it's very real to influence our youth. Well, first and foremost, like my favorite quote, um, I manage 11 teachers closely, like they're they're mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I always tell them, like, if you go somewhere and be famous, like, oh, you have a math degree, you can go make six figures right now. Right here, you're making about 51, but you have to understand you're going to live forever and they always get really confused by that but when you teach a kid something it's something important they're going to teach their kids that's going to teach their kids and you will live forever through your teaching like and, and I only taught math but I promise you I taught life more than math because those numbers don't matter but what does matter is what I teach you in my classroom that's my one opportunity to mold you as a person so I think with that too and it happens to where like you can I, I coach too. I coach basketball, powerlifting, volleyball. We won't talk about that. Um, so with those opportunities with that too, it's like those kids were in my classroom. Those were the athletes, but the athletes see you around. They see the, the influence you have and they draw in closer to you. So for some reason, this kid's at my practice and he, he don't even play with my team or he doesn't even powerlift. So with kids a lot, if you get that, that energy going that, hey, this adult, cares about me, is teaching me things, is pushing me. Kids want that. They're going to find you. They're going to seek you. Just like your guys is with your, your organizations that you start. Kids need that. And, and that's how you truly live forever. I'm going to live forever. I may not be the richest person in the world, but one day someone was like, yeah, I had this black man. She had dread. She was acting a fool because that's one thing too is like, I won't code switch. Right. And I get, I do get backlash for that in a sense of you're very uncommitted. Yeah, I am. Whoever I am here is who I'm going to, this is what the kids need to understand that this is who I am all the time. Mm -hmm. And so with that, it's like, they're going to be like, there was that wild woman, mm -hmm. but she taught me this and I taught my kids this and then they're going to teach their kids. So I, I mean, through the kids, you live, you really live forever. I love that you said you teach life more than you teach math. That really hit me home because our educators are honestly, you know, some of these kids are not in their household because parents got to work. They have to bring food to the table. And so who's the next person to teach them life? It's people like yourself. And look, Ken Henry, you've also been around a lot of youth. For different reasons have they been introduced to your life, some very unfortunate reasons and very sad Right. But what I want to, you know, depict is there's a lot of African-American kids, mainly little boys that you have worked with. And, you know, I want you to kind of uh, dig deep on how you've influenced the youth, whether it's California or in Texas. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And it's interesting. See my, my coffee mug here. So that says to teach. Yeah. I saw this like, oh, this is my cup right here. Absolutely. Right. She's saying that is exactly it. Um, yeah, you know, I think because what you're saying is that like you touch one, they have a field of influence just like we do, you know, and then, you know, you're going to touch that group just by your being, you know, and those who want to change or are, are in that place, you know, in, on their journey in life, they're going to be inspired and they're going to start. Right. So it's like a domino effect. But yeah, I mean, I've had from from, you know, uh, being a youth pastor in churches in California to working in the foster care system, working with at risk families, saving placements of kids, um, all that into up until even, you know, now with Code Black with the mentorship program, it is. Yeah, it's all about 
really getting them to have exposure. And I love, you know, what you said about, you know, not code switching, right? Because it, it's it's not, and it's not about, oh, I'm, I'm repping who I am or, you know, this is, no, because I do believe, you know, you know, at the same time, yeah, we want to grow to be better people as far as whether it's academically, you know, finances or whatever. But at the same time, you want to show that you could still be authenticity is very important, right? And there's a place for you. Right. And that's what we have to teach the world, you know, and I love it. Like for me, honestly, I, I never had dreads and in, 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 while I was in the South, I get, you know, and I realized that was like the, the kind of the oppression in a way I, I had because it just wasn't going to fly, you know, the way my mindset was in our family or whatever. But I go to L.A. And I'm there and I'm seeing people just like being free and doing, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to grow my hair out, you know, and start growing out. And I loved it. Right. And it's and it has become a part of me. And um, I don't. I, I go in any space because I'm Ken Henry. I don't think about dreads or my hair. I think I'm an entity. I'm here for a purpose. I'm here to serve a purpose and I'm going to do that. If you choose to, you know, just, just judge me based on that, then that's you. So I teach youth that a lot. That is so important to expose them to opportunities outside of their communities so they can see possibilities, but also to make sure that they understand like the, I don't care how hard it is and how rough it is take this environment that you've been given because it's for a reason. I don't believe it's none of us. None of this is by coincidence and you're going to, your strength is going to come from this. And so we look at these things that you endure, these things that you have been so, you know, resilient at surviving through, and you're going to be able to use these skills here in the real world. Same thing with athletes, you know, that competitive spirit, that fight, that push, that's pushing yourself, conditioning yourself. That's the same thing as it applies to life when you're, you know, reaching goals. So just getting them excited, you know, with the King Connect, show platform, my formula is inspiration, motivation, action. The reason why I came up with that is because I believe that it has to be in that order. You know, from all the years and years of working, uh, he's not motivated. She's just not motivated. Well, when a person's not motivated, that's because they're not inspired. You show me one person that is inspired, right? That's not motivated. It's not going to happen, mm-hmm. right? They're inspired, then they get motivated, and that motivation by default results in action. They start doing something. So you have to, inspiration is really the key with all of us, even us as adults today. Um, you have to figure out how to inspire one another. So youths need inspiration. You know, they don't need a, a lecture. They don't need constant pointing out what's wrong, what they're doing wrong. They need to be inspired. And so if we can um, really think about that, and it's easier than what we think, to be honest with you, then you can see some instant gratification. Yeah, no, I love what each and every one of you guys bring to the table, and I'm very, um, you know, what is by coincidence is bringing these panel members and what's coincidence is all of your your life paths kind of are similar. Yeah, it's kind of very neat to see how y'all are telling your stories, but it relates to another panel member. I think that is beautiful um, and how the chemistry is really strong in this panel. What you guys can do motivate and of course influence, right? To then motivate. Now, as I mentioned, we are living in history. Okay, this is what this is about, black history. We're living in it. We're gonna talk about this in 10 years from now. And we're starting to see powerful positions being filled by African-American brother and brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. It could be within your own region from attorneys to principals mm-hmm. or even a little bit higher, like our vice president, mm-hmm. our president that we had. So. I want to know what this means to you or what it means to you when you were growing up and not seeing it. And now you're seeing it within our president, um, Obama, and then, um, you know, then also our vice president. How deep is this for you and what does it mean for you? Uh, I'll go first on this one. Um, I think it's it's life changing. It's, it's life changing. It um, to piggyback on what Kim was saying, um, the inspiration portion of that. Um, when you see people um, getting through what were proverbial glass ceilings that have been there for so many years and so many still exist, um, it's it's very, very encouraging. It's inspiring and makes you now um, have a, a foot in the game. Someone at the table is very, very influential, but if they're at the table and they're not speaking, it's kind of um, counterproductive. But then getting to that table is a step. You have to go step by step by step and then um, not necessarily slow steps, but just um, the ones that stack on top of one another and get us closer to where, um, an equality space. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's huge seeing people in different positions across the board, not just 
how we were portrayed as only either athletes or rappers or anything that was entertainment based, but not actually came out of academia or came out of anything, artistic ability, all these things that were so multifaceted. Um, I love seeing uh, more and more people of color, black and brown and of whatever ethnicity, uh, just more diversity. I like seeing people that in the places of influence and places of power to do things. And um, also it's, it's um, you're accountable now. You got to put that hand back. Um, and on, at times people get to places and they kind of forget their uh, <laughs> their trek to get there as well as someone pulled you up. So, you know, you're accountable as you get there to put a hand back to, to qualify people too, though. We can't automatically assume because someone's there of a certain ethnicity, they now owe you a hand. They owe right. you a, they do not. They right. owe you to hold you accountable. They're not going to let you slide somewhere else and then take two steps backwards or 10 steps backwards because you're now there and you're not handling your business. So right. it's all about us being accountable. I think it's amazing. Um, and uh, also knowing that someone helps you get there. Someone helps you. I don't care what level you are, or whether you were Barack um, and uh, uh, Kamala, anybody, someone helps you. And they're very vocal about that, saying that people have helped them along their pathway. Um, it's on us to do it at every level, whether it's somewhat small as um, locally, all the way to federally, whatever it may be, putting that hand back. Um, but it's, it's a great thing to see, though. It's, it's very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love, you know, seeing it. And, and I think you bring up a good point is now a lot of, you know, culture diversity is having a seat at the table. I think that's awesome. And just like this pa panel is powerful, be powerful at your table, have a voice as well as holding yourself accountable. I think those are great, great, um, you know, points that you bring up, Clarence. Now, um, you know, a lot of our youth right now are seeing these uh, influential people of positions of power. And our little ones, this is now their norm, okay? Where it wasn't our norm growing up, is now their norm. So what does that mean also for the youth, seeing now more people in position in power that are black and brown or even other cultures? I think, first of all, I think this is beautiful, but what is y'all's um, take on that? I think for me personally, being in, and I always did um, higher level schools, so... For instance, when I was 22, I was teaching and there was a 21 year old in my class. Like, so I always had older kids. And when, before when it was um, our dude, it, when, when there's a black president, it was more like black kids walked around with their chest very hot. They were very proud. It was almost like, a, you can't tell me nothing. And I loved it because when I was in high school, that's when it all went down. And I can tell you that next day at school, I was like, I'm an act fool. So <laughs> it's like a vibe. And then when there was that switch, it was almost like a plague happened within schools. And it was just the dynamic change. There was this, this fear and it, it, it had a bad taste. I wish I could explain it better, but within a school, you could tell that the world changed. Mm. And then this last time when it just happened again, it was like, you know, when you watch those movies and they throw the paper, I ain't never been in a school like that, but you know, when they throw the paper and it's like last day of school, that was the vibe. Like at first it was like, are people going to act a fool? Wait, wait a minute. And then when the next day, when everybody was like, it was like that, the happiness was back. And what I think it is, is we have a lot of kids of color, Hispanic and black, especially where I'm at now with black teachers and, and us being black that next day, it's like, yo, it's it's back to how it felt with Obama. Like, yeah. we're, we're, we're proud. Like, we are here. We count. And it's funny how you cannot talk about it because obviously like, it's an atmosphere where you don't speak about it. But even at the age, the kids feel it. Yeah. So that representation, it, it's not even spoke about, but you feel it. Yeah. it it's nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's super strong. I think you're bringing up a good point. And I think that we can all probably resonate as adults on, um, you know, feeling some of that, whether you went to work or how you had to be positive or um, everything, have to be a positive mindset, of whatever a, you choose to vote, right? Um, and so I think that's something that it's crazy that our, our kids feel it too, um, but we have to make, you know, history uh, be present telling the right narrative and making a difference. Now, I'm going to take you guys back to history here. Now we're here. We are Black History Month. We have to talk a little bit about our historic figures. And I'm going to take you back um, maybe to even where you were a child or even in college. How did you feel when you read uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s story? Malcolm X, Maya Angelou, Harriet Tubman, even some of the stories we're reading now. These are really extensive stories um to me it hits me core and, and it hits me really deep but what 
did you guys feel when reading these stories and what they had to go through and how things were so segregated back in the day? Yeah. Well, I, I'm very visual, uh, very, very visual. And so um, that's something I always, uh, I, I contemplated on a lot. I, I, I tried to visualize what it was like. I was a kid that asked a lot of questions to my grandparents, my great uncles and aunts. And uh, I was so grateful that they were, uh, they wanted to talk about it. They were open to talking about it. And a lot of these things were, even though they didn't share it, like, uh, you know, they were in so much pain, but those, these were a lot of painful things that they went through. Um, that they have, had to tolerate, you know, and so when I started hearing the great stories, like of even slavery, when I'm like, it was even worse than what they were telling my grandparents were telling me, because now they were free, and now I'm hearing about slavery and the Underground Railroad, and then the, you know how cold it was, and they were in water and rivers, and like the, the dogs coming after them, and some people getting legs, you know, feet bit off, and just the inhumane uh, treatment and, uh, and the brutal abuse, and but the the resilience they had the courage they had, the fight to say, I know we, I don't care. I'm not going to accept this indoctrination. I know who I am. I know who we are. We're not going to accept this. It inspired me. And I've always been a type of person where, um, for me, I've seen where when I see something like that, I'm like, wait, so what is my responsibility? Like, this is one person who did this. Okay, what it what is my fight? What's my battle? What am I supposed to do? You know, because we have we we have present day Harriet Tubman's now, right? We have present day MLKs, present day Malcolm X. And I look at that just even biblically, because you know, I am a Christian and I look at biblically, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to keep talking about what John, Mark, and all of them. That's great. And I know it now, but this is a new day. And we're supposed to be, I can't get to to learn that new thing. If I'm not looking around like, because I'm the I'm the new Mark, I'm the new Luke, right? And so for me, it's just always been very inspiring to see our great leaders, and sometimes complex. I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes it was very um, for me confusing because I, what I was learning about Martin Luther King and what I was learning about the story of Malcolm X, and there are two different approaches to it. I understood both. Because I'm like, well, God, I don't know when they, you know, they need, they want to hit with each get hit back, you know, like those kind of things are you attack. But then I'm like, oh, but I know this is the right, like it's loving. You want to be a better example. They already think you're like this. And so I was so complex and um, I would get those same responses from adults when I would ask them, hey, who do you like more? Because I would ask those questions. And of course, if I talk to certain family members, oh, Malcolm, because you know what? And, you know, they, they were they were more like that. And it was like, no, you know, Martin and more of my spiritual family is like, you know, Martin, because, you know, God is going to fight this battle, whatever. And I've always been in a very weird place with that, you know, because I'm like, OK, well, how much fight? I mean, right. I have somebody, you know what I mean? And so um, so for it just it's inspiring. I think the, and those stories matter and they are important. And we have got to, um, and there's so many more that you don't get. Like when I took African American history and literature, I was so grateful because, you know, I know of the uh, the the Carter G. Woodsons and all the other folks, and and you know that that started these things behind the scenes, right? That did these things that didn't get so much notoriety that are just equally important. Because sometimes we can do like biblical figures. Well, I'm not Jesus, right? Oh, well, I'm not M. L. K. He was chosen. Oh, well, I'm not Malcolm. No. But there are all there's so many other people that did amazing, great feats for us, right? That names you don't hear a lot, right? So you can still do something. So yeah, I think the inspiration would be my word, I'd say. Beautiful. Um, now I do want to highlight some comments that we have that are super important. I do have Melinda saying, I can't wait for my husband, who's an educator, to see the playback of this panel. He's a teacher of multicultural students and he he he's got it. I'm so thrilled for him to see the panel and the encouragement that he can take to continue to be that one light to at least that one student that will shape a future. Thank you so much, guys. I think this is important. You guys are influenced at least one person that could even within the household, the husband, a child. I have Kim saying so many important concepts discussed. This is a great show. I have Amanda saying, that's my cousin, love key. Then I have... Um, you, another comment, Truth Ken Henry. Um, so I love all this and I, I want, I have a couple more, you know, important questions. So I want you guys to just hang tight here. Um, you know, there is a period where we all, as an individual, as an adult, as even whenever we grow up, we find ourselves, we find who we are, we get confident in our skin, um, in our career, in our workplace. 
And I want you guys to talk about the pride that you guys have within your culture and how you found yourself of being an African American and not letting what you see in the media or those stereotypes really influence you. I think that's important. I know Keandra kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I want to also influence the ones watching that once you find yourself, be confident within your culture and have some pride. So let's talk a little bit about that. For me personally, it's it's something that started really young with my mom and, and I'll applaud her again. It's, I always was taught who I was and I had no other option. And so luckily when I go in the street or when I walk in any room and I sit at any table, I'm never gonna be quiet. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna always wait to be spoken to. Um, my mom taught me really young that no one's going to make me or treat me any type of way. Like you are, you are going to hear me and you're always going to respect me, which didn't work as a child. Like I got in a lot of trouble because she wasn't like, Hey, but you got to chill, chill. But with that, it really did. It was molding for me for mm-hmm. sure. And and now as an adult, I, I know that responsibility of teaching kids that they have to have that same respect for themselves and hold them, themselves to that standard of everyone's going to see me and respect me. And whether I be a Hispanic, whether I'm Latin, whether I'm white, whether I'm black, I'm here and this is who I am mm-hmm. unapologetically. Mm-hmm. So that that's all I can give to it is be yourself no matter what, because you can like or, or dislike me, but I'm always going to be me. And I have to go home and be able to live with what I presented to the world that day. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that we are showing pride within this show um, and continuing it. Now, diversity is super important. And look around, look at around in us and, and even in your household, in your workplace. It's all around us. Right. Um, and we have an extreme diverse culture all over the place. So now tell I want you guys, each panel member to kind of answer this. The last focus phrase, phrase, excuse me, that we have for Black History Month and the importance of it, which is, American, African-American diversity in the workplace. What does that mean to you and how important is it today? I feel that African-American diversity in the workplace is is vital for a number of reasons. Um, One of which being in order to have a conducive working relationship with others, you need to have people from all different backgrounds. One, because your perspective may be different than mine, and uh, X, Y, and Z down the line. So when we have multiple perspectives from multiple backgrounds, we're going to have a, a smorgasbord, if you will, of ideas, perspectives, and how we're going to approach certain things, as well as we're going to be aware of certain things that at times may be considered um, inappropriate. Um, sometimes people can be tone deaf or they can be um, detached from certain things that really are offensive and or create unhealthy work environments. But because there's only certain dynamics or certain um representation at that place or at that in that employment or in that field that um the other minority is either suffocated their voice is not heard they're um almost kind of shunned away from actually putting input into this type of discussion and or putting forth their their stamp or their piece on that place because you you're employing someone right so you're giving them currency for their service but them being there some are being employed and not given the voice to actually have an impact or an in, input on certain things. So having more diversity and having people at every level of that company um, that can also have a perspective that's going to be heard, I think is vital. It's, it's very, very important. I love the fact that, um, well, in the field that I'm in, in, in the uh, legal field, um, it's a very, very, to say lightly, um, it's, it's very dominated uh, by, uh, Either it was initially Caucasian men, and then um, it became other ethnicities have smaller per- percentages of it, and then women even getting into it. It was very, very old and archaic in its actual vision and how it was actually going about and applying itself. So I, I love seeing now more and more people of all walks of life coming into courtrooms, coming in as attorneys and everything else, and doing a, a paralegal, whatever the case may be, in a legal field as a whole, having an actual different type of approach and these things not solely being how they were for so many years. I love seeing it. I will do my part of making sure that continues. Um, And a lot of places are going to continue to change over these uh, upcoming years and how things go forward. I think it has to continue. I don't think it should be done on a a basis of let me hit a quota because, you know, companies for a while had a quota. You know, well, let me go ahead and appease them, throw somebody on really quickly, 
they'll be okay, give them a good salary. They're not going to actually, you know what I'm saying, cause any rucks at the table. But now I, I'm I'm happy we're getting away from just being appeased or being um be happy to be here almost type of thing. That's not the uh, the way for progress or change. So um, I'm ecstatic to see it continue to progress. And um, it's very, very, very important. Has to continue. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, seg- segue from him with that is it's qualified. That's exactly what I was going to say. For me, it's, it's, it's first of all, we, it's it's not about just being black or whatever. You need to be qualified. But once you're qualified and uh, you're there, it is all those things, you know, they both just say it. It's and because that perspective, that point of view is so, so imperative. Like we honestly are stronger together. And then, you know, another thing I like to teach on is cultures within cultures. So, you know, you can't say all black folks are the same. That's absurd. All white folks are the same. That's absurd, right? It, there's cultures within cultures. So we are able to learn. It's not just so, so that whole like, oh, let's, let's get our one black guy, one black girl. Like that made no sense, <laughs> you know, right. Because, you know, there's still so many different perspectives, right? It's not about um, skin, color, skin color, but when you do have that qualified Black person in a workplace, and I have been there sometime, like I said, and it sounds like we've all had experience with that, where you've been kind of that only one at the table, you know, to bring that perspective. And uh, it is very important. It's, and in my opinion, it is nothing to take lightly, but I've seen in uh, many cases in, that, in my experience with that is that we've benefited majorly, our mission because of that, you know, we've benefited in a major way. And the reason why, uh, for instance, I'll talk about the Compton Task Force we have in um, Los Angeles. And that started because we were like, well, gosh, when we got the numbers and we saw how many black women were affected in the region, but we didn't have that much representation leadership wise. And we're like, well, it's our responsibility. And people came together and, um, you know, we worked and worked and finally built that that task force, which is still going now in 2017. But why? Because there's a perspective that if we're going to be helping these victims, and it seems like you're helping more of these victims that are black, then you need black perspective. Someone who knows the black experience that can kind of come and tell you that approach you're doing. That's not going to work. That approach you're doing right there. Maybe that works for this population. You're going about it all wrong here, you know, um, those kind of things. So so it's very, very imperative to have that representation. Yeah. And Keandra, I want to kind of throw it lastly on you on how important African-American diversity in the workplace is. But not just that. How are we also going to um, support our own culture and bringing them into the table that we're sitting so that they can also make a difference? I think with with that in. And when you asked the question the first time, I was like, it reminded me, you know, back in the day when people would be like, uh, everybody can't be Jordan. Everybody can't be the NFL. But for black boys, if you ask them what they want to do, they're going to say an NBA player or NFL. Why? That's the only time they see black people, especially back in the day. So when you when they when he goes into the the, the courtroom, whether it be for a good reason or, or bad reason, and he's seven years old and he sees the lawyer is is a black man. He's like, oh, I'm gonna be that man. But he's never going to say that unless he sees it. Mm. And and a lot of times in education, you 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 ask them to write these papers on things they want to be, and it, it's only someone that they know of. And it is Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. So being in the workforce and having these high important roles or something that they want to do, they got to see it to believe it. Mm. And, yeah. and that's just that's how I see it. And um, the second question you asked me, which with what we're gonna do about it, right? Mm-hmm. I think for me, it's I'm gonna live forever. And I'm going to live forever by teaching these kids. But it's also, I owned, I bought my first house at 24, right? Mm-hmm. So who am I to not see a 24-year-old that I know that could be doing the same thing as me and not teach them the ropes? Like, hey, you were paying for that apartment, which you could pay in a mortgage. Let me teach you how to do it. Mm-hmm. Hey, you, you could be in education. You have the degree for it. You're still waitressing. But hey, I got you. I can show you how to do something different. Right. So it's reaching that handout and not always in a sense of like, do what I do. But how can I help you? Because if we're not helping each other, who's going to help us? Yeah. Yeah. No, I love all the perspectives that you guys brought up. And um, most of the things that you guys do is um, not only maybe did someone help you guys, but you are helping others as well, whether it's the kids, it's our youth, it's 
teachers, it's our peers in our workforce. Now, I want to kind of open it one last time before we do our closing. I know we're kind of coming close to the end of the show, but if you guys had to leave our viewers that are watching you guys and they're soaking it all in, and I think it's so important that you have the attention of those watching. If you had to leave them with one last thing, whether it's about what our show was really stemming from, right, or the Black history, what this month really means, what would you leave our guests with? Uh, I'll say, you know, if you're black, if you're white, if you're brown, if you're whatever you are, seek to understand is, is what I will say. Do not expect anybody that does not live your experience. And again, when I talked about cultures within cultures, I'm speaking even to the same, if you're in the same a relationship, same space, same race. If we're ever going to make progress and we're going to grow, do not expect other people who don't have your experience to relate to your story, but you can expect them to understand your story. And the only way that happens is if we sit to seek to understand and you help me to see it from your side, right? And that's how we're gonna make progress. But if we constantly try to expect someone who doesn't have walked in my shoes and have my experience to, to get me and to, to relate, we get frustrated, all right? And then we get nowhere. So seek to understand folks. Don't expect folks to relate if they don't have your story, but you can expect them to understand, but we must all want to seek to understand. I agree with that. Um, I think understanding is very, very key and the part about seeking to understand. Oftentimes when um, things that are touchy or discussed, people are listening to respond as opposed to listening to digest what they're hearing and actually taking a second to remove themselves from the equation and actually see where someone is coming from. So right. I totally agree with seeking to understand is being very, very vital. I also want to touch on the fact that Black history is American history. Um, oftentimes it's um, kind of itemized out and placed into a separate uh, bucket, so to speak, but it's part of American history. It's not always been a, illuminated at the same type or it's always been distinguished, but it's American history. Um, so I think it should be, uh, Definitely poured into our youth education, uh, uh, publicized into media, anything else along those lines. It's all, we all have history of different walks, but as Americans, whether African American, Latina American, Asian American, Native American, whatever other, whatever um, possible ethnicity you are, you have your portion of history that falls under the umbrella of American history. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you always take pride in that. Um, wear it like a, a badge of honor because it really is one. Um, educate yourself. Education is definitely going to be the um, opening up your eyes and give you a whole new vantage point. Exposure and education are two of the biggest vehicles for change. So I implore you to do that at all costs. And then just be compassionate. Be compassionate. Be a good person. If you're a good person, whatever walk of life you come from, and the old um, sandbox saying of treat those how you want to be treated, it's not very complex, but it's really, really, really strong if you think about it. It's very, very deep, but it's very, very uh, a small, almost cliche, colloquialism type of thing that's said, but if we are all to treat each other how we want to be treated um, and not look at them, well, that's not really my problem, so I'll be quiet about it. That's what perpetuates um, hate, bigotry, and all those things. So um, it's elementary, but if we can get that down pat, we'll be in a good place. Absolutely. And Clarence forgot one thing. And if you're a male and you're going to go into an institution of higher learning and you want to be an incredible dynamic man... <laughs> member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I had to throw in that one. You know what? I'm going to let you make that, Ken, because I know you, you want to get that one in there. And look, you guys do, um, as a fraternity, do a lot of things for the community. Um, it's not just your fraternity. There's other fraternities and sororities. So um, they do give back to the community. They do a lot for our youth. They do a lot for our society. So I still love that you plugged it in. Um, but I do want to end with my my um, powerful woman that we have on the panel. So, Keandria, what is one last thing that you had to leave our viewers with? Um, this is how I connected with Giselle from this. Is I just dropped a, a Black History Month T-shirt for my business. I just started my business at the end of last year. Right. I got the license for it and everything. Uh, very proud of that. Um, but it, I, I got a key to fitness shirt and it says more than a month. And then the next day, LeBron came on an interview and was like, um, they were like, so how do you feel about Black History Month? And he said, it's more than a month to me. It's 
it's always Black History Month. So I, I have a more than a month shirt. And then LeBron went on live and was like, here you go, Key, but forgot to put Key to Fitness in it. I'm not mad at him. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> I'm not mad at him. But that's what it is. It's like yeah. Black History Month can't be just a month. Right. Like you have to be proud. You have to be speaking. You have to hear these stories all the time. And that's for other like there's Hispanic Month. Hispanic Heritage Month. And I didn't even know that till I became an educator. But it's like, it shouldn't be a month. Live within who you are and be proud of it and share that and, and give into that, feed that year round. Yes. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be a, a celebration or, or a month needed for these stories to be talked about in, in these, these moments like this, period. It should be Black History Month is every month, every day. I'm unapologetically Black every day. Well, you know what? It, it's it, we have to attribute that to our our great America. Let's just be real about it. That, yeah. that we're forced to do this. You know, like why did, why is there black fraternities and sororities? Because we weren't allowed in the other ones, right? So we and until we we face that history and we take ownership for that. You know, same thing with black entertainment television, Univision, right? If you would let us in here and let us show our people you know, some great examples of people in media, we would have to create these things. So um, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, so every all of you guys that are watching right now, please put in the comment if you want to see this panel again. L literally, we could probably go for another hour. Um, there's a lot of great knowledge that every single one of these panel members bring. And I just want to definitely highlight what Clarence said. Knowledge is power, power. okay? Pride comes from that. So definitely educate yourself or get around people like um, this panel members that are here with us that are willing to give um, their experience, their secret sauce, all of that good stuff. So I want to thank, um, I say this with a, a gratitude uh, heart. I want to thank our panel member today for uncovering how important this month is. Like he said, it's more than a month um, to us and how important it is to our culture and how proud um, we are to celebrate. So I want to thank you guys all for being on today's show. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So your skin is a part of you and your ethnicity is a part of your culture. So I want to thank you guys all for tuning in to Talk To Me Tuesday on a Tuesday. The more that you guys share it, the more we get to educate, the more that we get to influence and then motivate someone that's also watching right now. So we want to thank you guys for tuning in to Talk To Me Tuesday on a Tuesday. I'm your host, Maddie B. Till next time.